policy roundtables, and it forms part of a series which we're doing this autumn entitled Thinking About the Future. I'm Anthony Teasdale from EPRS, and it's great to see so many of you already online, over 100 people. Uh, welcome to the event. Um, we're going to be talking today about a subject which is of growing importance, not least for policymakers and indeed for politicians and others who work in the political community. How will artificial intelligence change the future? How will it change humanity? We're going to be exploring the social and political implications of our digital futures. And to get the conversation off to a flying start, we have uh, invited Vladimir uh, Shuka, who was, as you may know, the uh, Director General for about seven or eight years of the Joint Research Centre uh, in the European Commission and is now working as a Senior Policy Advisor at UNESCO in Paris, together with uh, his uh, colleague uh, Jean-Philippe Gamel, to talk about uh, a, a report which they've done for the European Commission entitled Humans and Societies in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, this is a, a major scene setter which attempts, in effect, to try to chart the social, the um, political, uh, the economic, and more than anything else, the human consequences of artificial intelligence in the way that it's going to reshape our lives. So uh, it's a fantastically interesting subject and it's a very uh, stimulating read. I thoroughly recommend it to you. You can find it in the invitation. There is a, a link to that particular piece of work. And Ava Kiley, who uh, serves as the chair of the European Parliament's STOA committee, the um, uh, uh, um, panel rather, the EP panel on the future of science and technology, and is a member both of the Parliament's um, E-Trade Committee, the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, and of the Budgets Committee, uh, has joined us too and is going to give us a few scene-setting remarks. Um, then we're going to have the opportunity for um, a panel, a world-class panel really, of commentators, generalists, not experts in AI as such, but people who think a lot about uh, digital policy issues, to reflect and react to the uh, initial interventions, and they are Heather Graby, Director of the Open Society European Policy Institute here in Brussels, Andrea Render, who's a Senior Research Fellow at SEPS, the think tank, the Centre for European Policy Studies, and is also a visiting professor at both the College of Europe in Bruges and the European University Institute in Florence, Anthony Gooch, who's Director of Communications at the OECD in Paris, Chair of the OECD parliamentary network and also coordinates the OECD forum. Uh, and Laura N uh, Nursky, research fellow at Bruegel, who specializes in digital issues. And that panel discussion, which follows the initial presentations, will be uh, moderated by Marcus Scheuren, who is head of the special committee, which the European Parliament currently has on AI issues, the committee, special committee on artificial intelligence in a digital age, uh, AIDA. Um, so, um, I'm going to see if uh, Ava is with us at this stage, and if not, because she may be having some communication. There we are, Ava, welcome. Delighted to see you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It's a great pleasure to have you on board. Uh, Ava, as I say, is the chair of the STOA panel, the panel on the future of science and technology, the distinguished member of the European Parliament, and also a member of the Hellenic Parliament, uh, and also uh, chair of uh, and founder of the Future Forum. Ava, how do you see some of the issues which are raised in this area and the importance which they're going to have in terms of policy making in the future? Over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, first of all, I would like to, um, uh, to thank you for, uh, again, as our Director General of EPRS, organizing brilliant events uh, with distinguished speakers, and it's uh, a great honor that you invited me to participate, um, especially to open this roundtable uh, dedicated on the social and political dimensions of AI and the presentation of, uh, again, of excellent quality at JRC report, um, uh, the one that you mentioned, and that was, uh, it was very interesting for me to read as it touches upon issues that were not in the spotlight until recently, but I think now they are uh, actually being highlighted quite significantly with uh, with this analysis. 
um, we understand that this uh, transformation is changing everything. So it's not easy for us to cover all the aspects that AI is transforming. It's, it's basically everything. But what we need to understand is what are the issues that we need to address and we need to be proactive in order to have AI for good, um, if I may. Uh, since uh, it definitely, uh, the question is if it will change humanity, it will definitely change it. Uh, how uh, is the question? And what are the social and political implications that uh, they will benefit citizens and, and societies and communities and their futures? And what is um, uh, the scenario that we would like to, to avoid? Um, so, um, I always start by explaining how I see AI, so from automation, that it's most common, until having autonomous systems, taking decisions, not just providing us solutions, and uh, these decisions, if they are embedded also in hardware, could actually mean that there will be no human control. I saw already recently that in UK, um, they, they have a different approach, like they, they consider to not uh, have the obligation for human oversight of AI systems. So it's uh, very interesting to see this uh, public debate taking place and try to understand uh, how, where our position should, uh, should uh, be. Um, of course, uh, we all understand that the main challenges are uh, and used to be the concentration of power in these systems, systems that we cannot really understand because of the amount of data that we are processing and how this could lead into uh, lack of privacy, inequalities, increase of inequalities, it's also addressed in this report, and uh, discrimination, of course, of course, and everything that is far from having a human-centric AI, because losing control, um, it's uh, already by, um, by definition, not human-centric AI. So we have so many policy uh, initiatives, 600, I, I, I consider uh, globally, um, uh, that they try to approach um, uh, in a balanced way, artificial intelligence development. Now we have the AI Act and um, the, the top things that um, uh, we have to address is what we consider high risk. Um, I was uh, reading Andrea Zrenda's um, uh, articles recently and um, he, he said like, okay, risky AI is not everything, so don't you know, uh, try to pretend that if Europe does something, this would mean like a uh, huge implications and economic damage. It's like maybe 10% of, of all the AI applications and also the um, uh, maybe the burden for companies to comply into the new rules will not be that um, heavy. And this is uh, something that we should take under consideration if we want to have quality of life with artificial intelligence. Um, so we have, still we have to address the risks and to understand what is risky AI. Um, I have also to say that facial recognition is becoming a hot topic to discuss how much, when, uh, if, it, if it should be allowed. And beyond facial recognition, emotional recognition or uh, recognizing the sexual behavior and orientation of citizens, because this would mean that we could have manipulation of human behavior and choices. And one of the things uh, that are uh, the top key takeaways, uh, Vladimir, you did an excellent job, is uh, also the freedom of choice and even freedom of thinking. That when you talk about it, it seems like it's in a distant future, but no, it is not. It's actually already happening. Um, so I think we need to have um, uh, of high level discussions in order to be able to grasp a bit the, the essence and also the technological possibilities to balance and have safe AI, good AI, uh, but also to be able to be globally competitive in this technological uh, cold war, let's say, uh, because it beca became very geo geopolitical this, this mandate and Ursula von der Leyen was, was correct to highlight that. Um, in, in, uh, in terms of the European Parliament, we have been calling for um, the ethical committee um, and the high level experts group to provide us with a framework since 2017. I remember actually, I could claim that it started from STOA when we visited uh, uh, universities and we saw that they were really concerned about autonomous and weaponized AI. And we immediately uh, called the Commission and asked to set up um, a group that would deal with this and we would um, be basically proactive. So I have the feeling that uh, the parliament really set uh, high uh, the standards. 
And uh, recently with AIDA committee and Marcus excellent job, I think we have plenty of access and uh, plenty of like uh, MEPs participating and gaining new understanding of what the AI is. Um, I follow that with uh, a lot of interest, all the events they organize. And in parallel, we have um, in the, in the, under the STOA umbrella, we established uh, the Center for Artificial Intelligence. I have been working on AI several years now before it was in um, at the focus of, of our agenda at the parliament. And this Center for AI did something that I believe it was really essential for the European Parliament. It helped a lot to um, um, open up and start collaborating with global organizations and being able to approach excellent uh, um, uh, personalities and thinkers. Um, so what we did, um, and also uh, what we are trying to do uh, with Anton Yuch from uh, uh, OECD, is for the first time in a historical uh, moment, agreeing to work together, not to duplicate, but to join forces and uh, understand what are the minimum standards at the parliamentary level we would need to have, because we need to discuss about the democratic alliance um, where we would have to, you know, to start by establishing those standards and then trying to see how we can influence the rest of the world in using these AI systems in, in, in a way that could be acceptable as these technologies go beyond borders. So this is a great challenge for us and out, our outreach capacity, I think it has been uh, excellent since we established that. We have uh, world-renowned personalities from academia, international organizations, the private sector, the civil society, think tanks. So basically, Anthony, Andrea, and, uh, and uh, Anthony Tisdale was also invited, but in any case, institutionally, we collaborate also with Marcus um, uh, in this uh, the Center for AI. Um, I don't want to take more of the time, but uh, I would just la like to highlight um, just two, three uh, things that I believe we should really um, furthermore explore. Um, so I mentioned about the, the, the risk of emotional recognition. Uh, but also we need to understand that this goes uh, beyond our control when we talk about children's and children's rights. And we are not clear about how we will protect uh, children. And um, I think this is really essential. We need to be able to, to be aware of, of the dangers that exist. Um, also, I read uh, in this GRC report, um, the AI and creativity, how this sector has been uh, impacted by AI but also what it means if you have AI being creative. Imagine what this would mean, because you remember three, four years ago, um, Anthony Tisdale, we were discussing about the trends and we said like, the, um, uh, if you want to still have a job in the near future, creativity is something you should have and being able you know, to solve problems. But it seems that AI could take over most of, of, <laughs> of these uh, qualities. Um, so, um, I, I would finish and say, uh, these are the debates, how we can make sure that we will, for the first time, perhaps also monitor the whole life cycle of artificial intelligence systems, not as we did with GDPR, but go even further and more in depth of uh, monitoring, assessing, and also trying to um, understand uh, how these technologies are affecting us and being able to intervene. Um, to make sure that people are safe. And I think the possible actions that are also mentioned helped me uh, a lot because this is going to be an interesting year uh, in the European Parliament and the legislation in the AI Act and then the uh, Data Act uh, will really be essential for, uh, for um, the future. So um, I'm very happy that uh, uh, I'm here with you and I'm happy and uh, I'm waiting to, to listen to the panel discussion. Thank you again for this honor, Anthony. Thank you very much indeed, Ava, for those excellent scene setting remarks and also for all the work and support that you give to policymaking uh, in the Union and specifically here in the European Parliament on these very, very important and pressing issues and to really delve uh, into the detail of this, uh, Vladimir Shuka and uh, his uh, co-author, uh, Jean-Philippe Gamel, are going to uh, say uh, something about the report which they've uh, put together, Humans and Societies in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. 
Vladimir is now, as I mentioned earlier, Senior Policy Advisor at UNESCO, having served as Director General of the JLC in the Commission between 2012 and 2019. And previously, he was Director for uh, Culture and Media uh, uh, in the DG for Education and Culture in the European Commission. Uh, previously, he worked in Slovakia. He was Head Director of the uh, Slovak Research and Development Agency and was Research, Education and Culture Councillor of the Slovak representation to the European Union. He's held a variety of visiting academic uh, appointments in his own country and many others. And Jean-Philippe Gamel is advisor to the Director for Talent Management and Diversity in the European Commission's Directorate for Human Resources. He previously served as a member of the Cabinet of European Commissioner Tibor uh, Navrashisk, uh, head of the uh, office of uh, Vladimir Susha when Vladimir was uh, Director General of the JLC, and also worked as an administrator in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, and likewise has held a variety of visiting academic positions, uh, notably in France. So I'm going to hand over to Jean-Philippe and to Vladimir to tell us a little bit about the work that they've been doing and the principal findings of their research. Over to you. Many thanks, Anthony. Uh, many thanks for inviting me. And I'm uh, very happy to be in this uh, nice company uh, together with you and with Eva. We have been working in my time uh, of GRC a lot with European Parliament and with STOA. Uh, in, in particular and with Eva personally. Um, thank you for this opportunity and, uh, you know, just let me introduce this, uh, this uh, um, uh, presentation with, uh, with the reasoning why we, we thought that this is important, as you said, that this, this series is about the future and, and the future perspective. And this is what, uh, what we have been thinking with Jean-Philippe that we need uh, simply to look at, uh, at the issue, which is a little bit longer term. Because even uh, in, in GRC, we have been producing quite a lot of uh, forward-looking studies and these studies were um, a little bit too technical to uh, focus on technology, on, on, the, on the impact on economy, et cetera. And we have been somehow missing this human and societal dimension. So then we thought that, uh, uh, my God, artificial intelligence is everywhere and it's penetrating uh, every hour to uh, all uh, spheres of um, our society. So there must be an impact. So then we put together the group of, uh, of uh, uh, several dozens of experts from all over the world and and we we have been talking to them we have been working on this on this report on this study and uh, here are the main 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 results so our our intention was to look a little bit uh, in a longer term uh, uh, longer term perspective and look at this uh, from uh, from the perspective of policymakers, obviously this uh, this report was uh, was written for the Commission in the Commission or in in European institutions. So then we have been looking uh, through the angle of the policymakers at the EU level, obviously with some possibilities also for using it at at, at all other other levels. Well, if if there is one uh, if there is one uh, key message uh, which uh, was penetrating out of all uh, our our debates, discussions, research is uh, transformation, 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 humans and societies. Uh, there is, there was an agreement of all uh, scientists, uh, uh, experts we have been talking to, that we are going to have a huge, or we are going to witness a huge transformation of humans and society, something which is unprecedented and never experienced in a, in a human history, such a fast and, and, and profound transformation. So then uh, not only due to <clears throat> malintentional use of artificial intelligence, also due to very well intentional use of artificial intelligence, we will see uh, this transformation. So all good applications will have a transformative impact on humans and societies, and we have to be ready for it because otherwise uh, um, we may we may have a huge, huge problems. 
just a, a, a small reminder. <clears throat> I, I'm sure that majority of you, you are aware that artificial intelligence is not one technology, is not uh, uh, automation, it's not robotics, it's not a face recognition, it's all of them and, and even more. So then it's better to talk about artificial intelligence systems uh, because it is uh, it, it's a it's a group of different technologies which are evolving as we as we speak. So then um, uh, this this is this is the main message that that positive changes will have a disruptive a disruptive nature and disruptive impact on on the society. So this was the main main um, outcome. Uh, which which we uh, which we got uh, from the report, and uh, this is uh, this is how we are uh, how, how we have been uh, uh, framing framing the report. Um, who is who is concerned? Uh, so we may say that okay, so that there are not that many people uh, um, in in some places or in some cases uh, which are connected to uh, to internet, uh, uh, but that's not true. If we are talking about European Union and not North America, almost everybody is concerned. And then, of course, there is this spillover effect also on, on people who are not connected on Internet. So then, in a way, the all humanity, uh, all societies will be uh, will be somehow in one or another way um, uh, influenced by by this. So at, at, at this moment, I would like to to pass over to to Jean Philippe, but he signaled to have some uh, some technical problems as as well as I had them uh, uh, a few a few minutes ago. So then I, I'm just wondering if he's uh, if he's there, and if not, I will continue. Then uh, I, I think there is uh, what what needs to be done is is a distinction. Uh, we are in now in the in the time of narrow artificial intelligence. I think that we need to stress this. That's already now the artificial intelligence is much better uh, than than human intelligence in very narrowly defined sets of functions, but we are still not reaching this uh, uh, artificial general intelligence, which is another level of uh, uh, of uh, uh, development, and this is where the artificial intelligence should be working in in in, in a similar way as uh, as a human brain is working. Uh, and then uh, what, what we need to stress out is uh, that uh, uh, what we expect uh, all, also on the basis of this, uh, this, this work, this report, but also on the basis of, uh, of our previous uh, knowledge is uh, that the 21st century will be a century of discoveries of the brain, uh, of the functioning of the human brain. So as, as it was quantum physics and, and chemistry in 20th century, where we did uh, uh, this huge steps forward, uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge about our functioning of our brain will be the, uh, the, the, the discovery of 21st century. And this will be, this will be very, very well linked to the, to the discoveries uh, or, or progress of artificial intelligence uh, and also uh, general artificial intelligence. More we understand, the functioning of the brain more we will be uh, uh, able to understand uh, understand uh, uh, the, the the functioning of uh, of uh, uh, artificial intelligence one thing is is important that uh, most probably in the following years we will be talking about more intelligence that we will be having the more diverse understanding not only the human versus artificial intelligence but the, but the intelligence will will have a much uh, much more uh, meanings one thing which is uh, uh, already now extremely important that uh, th there is a, there is this discussion uh, going on if uh, the, the artificial intelligence will have a sort of uh, consciousness or if uh, uh, the artificial intelligence will uh, have the emotions but let's uh, let's uh, uh, set aside this question the many uh, many experts are saying that there will be a, a sort of consciousness. There will be certain type of emotions, but that's not important. What is important right now and for the following years is that machines are already now much better in recognizing and deciphering the human emotions than humans are. So this is very important. And if we go to the uh, to, to behavioral sciences, applied psychology, 
where we know that roughly 85% of the human's decisions are based on emotions or on this on these shortcuts. This is not a rational thinking. This is mostly emotional shortcuts. So then you see that 85% of the decisions of humans may be uh, a subject of a manipulation uh, if uh, uh, we, we, we understand and we take into account that uh, um, that uh, 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 emotions can be detected uh, and even um, somehow uh, somehow altered or manipulated by artificial intelligence. Um, you know, we we published in in GRC three years ago first European report on artificial uh, artificial intelligence, and, um, and 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 shortly after. Promoting this report, I have been talking uh, to all creative people. Don't worry, uh, we are quite certain that the creative jobs will not be uh, that much influenced by artificial intelligence. But after this study, I had to revise my narrative, and I had to revise that. And uh, and our conclusion is actually that uh, creativity is a non uh, not longer. Uh, uh, human prerogative. Uh, so that you see here, just an ex example, uh, the, um, the the piece of art made by uh, by artificial intelligence, and it was sold uh, it was sold uh, uh, in Christie's um, uh, uh, for for this uh, uh, quite incredible amount of amount of money. And then uh, music and many other as aspects uh, of the art are not recognizable from the human production that what what uh, artificial intelligence actually uh, has produced um, for me particular uh, uh, particularly interesting is uh, is this uh, gpt3 product gpt3 is is one uh, um, uh, type of algorithm or uh, artificial intelligence based um, uh, text producer uh, and the article was published a few months uh, uh, in, in the Guardian, uh, which was written by this artificial intelligence. And I, I, I really recommend uh, everybody to read it. And if you Google GPT-3 and the Guardian, you will get this article. And I think that uh, I, I was not, um, you know, I, I, I was not that that uh, scared. But when I when I read this uh, article, I, I started to to think. Um, a little bit more about about the, the future and, and different risks which are related to the future. Uh, you know, in the European Parliament, you know, in the European Commission and even GRC was responsible uh, for uh, for uh, implementation of the medical device directive and, and how much uh, uh, how much attention we, uh, we we put to to different medical devices to, to different medical uh, medical uh, uh, product. And, and and one of the recommendation of our uh, report is that nobody is actually looking to uh, artificial intelligence cognitive extenders. These are medical products. These are products which are already uh, uh, reaching the market, and we have absolutely no clue how to how to regulate this, how to look at the quality, how to how to look at them. And this is something AI cognitive extenders we, we used to have for many years. Uh, um, chemical uh, cognitive uh, enhancement. Uh, we have different drugs uh, which were able to improve uh, cognitive uh, capacities. And and a recent uh, uh, poll of uh, uh, Nature, which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the scientific paper, scientific journal, and, and they ask their readers uh, uh, how many of them have ever used uh, uh, cognitive extension. Uh, or cognitive enhancement uh, through, through uh, some of the drugs, and 22% and of respondents confirmed that they they tried uh, at least once uh, uh, this chemical extension. So then, what actually we want to say that the cognitive extension, cognitive extenders, AI-based cognitive extenders, which are helpful for treating the brain diseases like Alzheimer, are extremely useful. But there is no way that we will prevent them for recreational uses, uh, and and this is something uh, we should be we should be quite uh, uh, seriously considering uh, uh, what to do with this and how we are going to deal with this issue. And then brain computer interface 
is also something which is very close uh, to, to, to happening. It's, it's actually to a certain extent working in, in many labs. It's not uh, that we can fully download, uh, the, download the human brain consciousness into, into the computer, but they, this, is, this research and development is, is very, very far. Brain implants, you know, that Elon Musk, Neuralink, and, and two or three other companies are already, uh, already on the market. I, I looked into the databases and there are actually hundreds of scientific papers and patents which are filed uh, and registered for brain implants. So this is another field where we need to have a strong uh, focus and we have to, uh, uh, we have to innovate, simulate different scenarios and be ready from policy uh, 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 policy uh, point of view. Because, you know, this brain computer interface, we are actually, the, the one of the conclusions or the consequence may be digital immortality. That means that after the physical uh, physical disappearance of the human being, his or her consciousness uh, thoughts could be downloaded in a computer uh, and he or she can uh, actually digitally continue living and we have absolutely no reaction, no even not, not even reflection, what we would do in, in, in such a case. And then, then we have this huge, huge problem. Uh, we are uh, uh, now witnessing the COVID-19 pandemics and we are somehow uh, disregarding another pandemics, which is the mental disease pandemics. And, and uh, this is something uh, which is this is something which is really astonishing that how how much uh, we do not look at this uh, at this at this problem, which is related mostly to the young generation, young generation uh, below 24 years, and there is an increase since 2010, depending on the country or the region, it's between 15 to 25 percent of those young people. Uh, reporting the high level of stress, uh, panic, uh, anxiety, different types of uh, uh, of phobias, etc. So this is something which needs to be uh, very seriously looked at. We do not have a causal link with the digital transformation because nobody looked at this causal link. And I think that this is one of the urgent things which needs to be done. We have to look at these issues because otherwise, uh, the society will have a, will have a huge problem, and this is something I will be continuing in a minute because I see clearly link with with some possible future consequences of uh, of, of this. And one gloomy scenario is actually actually showing uh, um, uh, that uh, one one option is that we will not be um, actually having unemployed people uh, because of artificial intelligence, but, but we will have uh, the problem of finding the people because people will not be able to work because of different uh, different uh, mental uh, diseases and, and, and disinformation. So I, I mentioned this large group of experts and if there was one issue they all agree uh, unanimously was that uh, uh, artificial intelligence is a huge risk uh, uh, um, to liberal democracy and the free market because of erosion of the free choice. And, and this is very much linked to, to this uh, uh, issue of emotions, which I mentioned before, because if uh, uh, the, the vast majority of our decisions is emotional, and if somebody is influencing, impacting our, our emotion or manipulating the emotions, um, so that, that means uh, that, that we do not have uh, uh, freedom of choice, and then the all basic elements of liberal democracies, uh, democracy are at risk. But there are different other issues which artificial intelligence is bringing into into uh, it, 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 into the surface in the for the age of, of of AI and democracy. And I think this is uh, for us uh, um, uh, and from the perspective of this study, urgency to to start thinking. What does it mean to have a liberal democracy in the age of AI? How we should how we should reform it? How we should reshape it? And I think that this is uh, this is a very very important political political issue because we see uh, this uh, the, the, this threat to liberal democracy, which is radicalization, polarization, uh, psychometric profiling, different types of manipulation, 
information echo chambers, this, this uh, digital tribals, uh, tribaling, and, and, and many other elements which are actually very, very threatening. And uh, they are um, consequences to large extent of the algorithms. It's not that we suddenly have this radicalization and polarization and we don't know why. We know, and it is linked to attention economy, that the algorithms, even if they are not uh, 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 intentionally designed to uh, to uh, show and reproduce the the negative and polarizing content, we know that people are more attentive from uh, anthropological point of view to negative uh, to negative issues, and and this is what they what what those uh, uh, algorithm algorithms which were designed to maximize the attention of people on the advertisement. They they just discovered that uh, the more negative, more controversial content is is exposed, more people are staying and looking and watching. And I think that this is uh, this is one element. And many of those elements are uh, in a way covered by by EU legislation, but not all of them. And we do not uh, we do not uh, uh, um, in a way extrapolate them into in into near near future. Um, and then another huge risk is to have the the biggest inequality uh, and unfairness we we have ever had. When I mention uh, this uh, uh, cognitive extension due to AI, so this is something which is uh, uh, totally unnatural. Now we know that even if somebody is born in a poor family. He or she has a uh, has a potential or possibility to grow and be successful in the life, but it will be impossible to compete uh, with the, with the cast of super superhumans and uh, and the people uh, with this enhancement uh, uh, enhancement in 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 the future. Already now we see that minorities, either ethnic, national, gender, whatever. Are being discriminated. This is well documented. I don't need to. I don't need to go to to details. We have a different uh, different uh, uh, data um, colonization. We have uh, people from the, the the global south complaining about uh, uh, being uh, 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 being in a way colonized, and the data are being used for enrichment of of the uh, of the big companies. So these are all all issues which are very very important to look at, and uh, and I think that this is uh, our utmost uh, importance um, that that we are paying attention. From our perspective, the best bet is uh, education, but education needs to be uh, revolutionized. We need to get ready for the biggest threat, and and the biggest threat is this change, this transformation. We know that that uh, any transformation any change is uh, stressful for people so that but if we have a constant transformation or very often transformation there are some um, some uh estimations that that people will be changing maybe 7 8 10 times the job during their lifetime and uh, uh, so this is all uh, impacting uh, the psychology of people so that psychological resilience is the key word which is so important. So then, then the school, uh, whatever form uh, this this formal education will transform into, should take uh, uh, absolutely into account uh, uh, into account this, dimension, which can be in a way summarized by this EMC uh, uh, square, which E stands for empathy. And for mindfulness, and these two C's uh, are critical inquiry and compassion. So these are those dimensions of uh, of uh, uh, our education systems, which are completely ignored, except very very few exceptions. So then we are mostly focusing on on learning and and uh, and on, on this explicit knowledge, but we need to we need to uh, uh, strengthen. And reinforce those skills. There is a very, there are very good news. There are very good developments, and and I would definitely 
count uh, uh, this, this EU legislation, which is now in the Council and the Parliament proposed in April by the Commission. And then let me, allow, uh, let, let me also mention one, which I consider as a fantastic global development, and that is thanks to UNESCO. And actually this study, I, I, I took it with me to, to UNESCO, where I am detached by the Commission for a certain period of time. And uh, there is a fantastic development that UNESCO was able to reach uh, uh, a technical agreement. It's not still political. It will be hopefully done in November, but it's there is a uh, rich agreement of 193 countries on, on the global recommendations on ethics of AI. And all those aspects which I have been uh, referring to during this, this presentation are in one or another way covered by this, uh, these recommendations. I would really, really uh, advise European Union uh, to work very closely with UNESCO, because if I look at the, at the legislation at the EU level and recommendations, I would say that the match is 99%. So then I think that this is a huge opportunity of EU to get global with, uh, with this approach and, and, and influence, influence the world. So that's uh, that's all what we wanted with Jean Philippe, and I regret that he could not uh, uh, step in. Uh, it's it's undoubtedly uh, true that AI is a fantastic opportunity, and as as with all opportunities in the past, there are many challenges, and I think that we need to we need to look at those challenges. We need to get ready for this huge transformation, this huge innovative revolution which is going to, to, to change the society. And definitely future is not written yet. And we, and mostly we in Europe, should not let others to write it for us. We should be writing this future uh, for us and, uh, and with, with others for, for all global community and all global society. And uh, well, that's, uh, that's what this report was aiming at uh, to, to show what are those few elements uh, where we can where we can act now, and not to be surprised uh, uh, tomorrow? So thank you very much, and I'm uh, ready for any questions if they are uh, stemming from the future discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Vladimir. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, tour tour d'horizon and also tour de force and um, uh, cognitive extender in a very direct way because it's uh, forced us to think about a whole range of issues that perhaps. Uh, some of us had not uh, come across before, particularly this notion of potential digital immortality of one's own consciousness and the impact of algorithms in eroding free choice and thus challenging the fundamental uh, tenets of liberal democracy and indeed of, of, of market economics, the notion that there might be superhumans and um, the idea that we could have in the future robo-gov or algocracy, that's a word I'd not come across before. This is really terrifically interesting and um, you've uh, set the scene uh, really uh, extremely effectively if I may say so and uh, we can witness that in the fact that we now have 180 people uh, online watching this there'll be an opportunity for everybody to ask questions or make comments you can do that through the Q&A function or the chat function and behind the scenes we have a team of people who'll be picking those up and in due course Marcus Shoran uh, will do his very best to try and take as many of those questions either individually or grouped as practically possible. Um, I, I know that Jean-Philippe you had some quite significant um, connection problems. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, you probably are familiar with the basic propositions here so is there any particular perspective you would like to uh, br bring to bear now? If so please over to you. Thank you. So I, I managed to join just very, very late in, in Vladimir's presentation. Um, really, I apologize that I had these technical problems, but so it's difficult for me to add something. I guess that Vladimir has mentioned all the, the, the key elements and I trust that he has done it much better than I would have been able to do it. So uh, maybe at a later stage when questions um, pop up, then I might answer one of those. Except if Vladimir uh, seems that I should add something specific, otherwise let's maybe just wait until uh, the Q&A at the end. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Ava Kali is still with us. We also have the panel uh, whom uh, Marcus Shorin is going to introduce and there'll be an opportunity for everybody and anybody who has either spoken so far or will speak to come back in in answer to questions and answers. So over to Marcus. 
Uh, yes, hello, good afternoon, and, and greetings from uh, Jean Monnet House in, in uh, Bazoche, the, the, one of the, uh, the place of origin, birthplace of the European project, uh, one of our founding fathers, with, without whom we wouldn't be here altogether, at least not in this, this uh, formation. Um, indeed, the, the attendance that we have around 180 participants shows that uh, your study, uh, Vladimir and, and Jean Philippe, is, is very topical, it is uh, spot on. And it's a good time to discuss these issues. Uh, as Eva Kaini has pointed out in her introduction, Parliament has been working on these questions likewise, previously already in, in store with the store panel on the future of science and technology, and more recently since last year with our special committee on AI with a beautiful uh, musical name AIDA, um, which we started last year. And we're in the process of finalizing our report. We hope that unlike the opera, we don't end up getting buried alive. Um, I have, uh, I have the pleasure now today to have a fantastic uh, a panel of uh, experts in, in a broad area of fields related to, to AI in a broader sense. Uh, uh, Vladimir pointed out in his study that uh, uh, we need a cross-disciplinary approach to discuss these issues. So it's, it's, it's great that we have uh, four distinguished experts uh, with us here today. Um, so I will invite the, the four of them to give their introductory remarks uh, after uh, uh, my, my introduction, and uh, then we uh, open the floor for questions. I'll start with a, a question to the audience, really, it's a little opinion poll with, with which we want to start the exercise, uh, and I'll, I'll ask our, our colleague uh, but it's already there. The poll question is, the development of AI is about to trigger the deepest and fastest shift humanity has ever experienced. Do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, neither agree nor disagree, uh, as some disagree and as strongly disagree? So please vote now. I guess we give a short uh, deadline, maybe one or two minutes. Uh, oh, five minutes, okay. Uh, and if we have the time, we take the uh, opinion poll again at the end to see whether your perception has changed, uh, which would be interesting to discuss. Um, with that being said, we, we turn to our to our first speaker, um, Heather Graby, um, who of course is the director of the Open Society uh, European Policy Institute, a long-standing partner of the European Parliament and and uh, and EPRS, our research service. Um, she's no stranger not only to to Parliament but to the EU uh, sphere, of course, uh, since she was uh, advisor to uh, former Enlargement Commissioner Olli Rehn. And she also worked as deputy director uh, of the Center of, for European Reform, the CER. Um, Heather, in your in your work, how, how do you see um, the, the findings of the study that that Vladimir uh, presented earlier? Can you can you compare to the the main takeaways he just um, um, presented and the the actions he he he, he uh, meant, the, the authors mentioned in their study? How do you how do you see these uh, these takeaways? Can you go with them? Can you elaborate a bit from your perspective? Over to you. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thanks so much uh, to uh, to Vladimir Schucher and also to Jean Philippe for this report. It's a really important contribution to the debate that we need to have in Europe about artificial intelligence, particularly the way it it takes an interdisciplinary approach and it sets out a long term vision of where AI is going to take us as a society. It's really important to see AI not as a series of technical issues, but ones that will deeply affect democracy and even what it means to be human, how we how we might think. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read um, the very interesting uh, book Homo Deus by um, Hariri, the, the famous um, Israeli historian and thinker, uh, where he predicts that AI will really fundamentally change the evolution of humanity. Uh, so I think he would be answering number one in the poll that we've just been doing. And understanding the disruptive effects on humans, democracy and society is really vital. Um, at Open Society Foundations, we've been supporting organizations in this field for quite a few years. We've had actually an information program since the, nine, the early 1990s because we see that the digital transformation and particularly AI really will have enormous consequences for the openness of our societies. So for the rights of people, uh, also big opportunities, it'll change our economy, but it will also change very much how open our societies can be. And I'd like to highlight two very fundamental points um, that really, um, I think, complement what the report has to say, um, which are especially important for the openness of societies. 
The first one is about uh, democracy and rights and how they will be affected by AI, because this is AI is, is not just a vector of innovation and economic growth. It's ultimately a debate about the kind of society we want to live in. Um, and in particular, it shows the importance of having very inclusive policy making around technology, because there are cultural differences. Um, in how we understand the values and concepts that AI is challenging. This is a key point made in the report. For example, across Europe, we see different attitudes towards privacy, or in Germany, it's a paramount value. And in some other countries, it's not considered so important. Free will is, of course, understood differently in different countries, depending on history, culture, and of course, freedom of expression. Again, paramount, for example, in France, but how is it balanced with other things elsewhere? And AI will affect these, uh, these values and these concepts. Now, in the EU, we share a core set of values, which really need to be the starting point of our dialogue about how to manage AI and how to guide the European approach to it, particularly through regulation, which is the EU's competitive advantage. It's our distinctive feature compared to, for example, the Chinese model. Um, and this is where the EU has a real chance to lead the world right now in encouraging the development of trustworthy AI and a human-centered approach to technology. People are starting to get worried, rightly so, about the impact of AI, and that will get bigger as they start to see, you know, articles written by, by robots, as, as Vladimir was pointing to earlier, but also the way that um, automated decision-making really affects their lives in areas like housing, employment, education. If you know that your CV is going to be read by a machine, um, a machine that may be programmed with biases in it, which could increase discrimination against you, are you going to trust the recruitment system um, that would be handling such a thing? Would you even want to use it for recruiting yourself as, a, as an employer? If you are concerned about being discriminated against in housing, how happy are you going to feel about the idea that your local authority uses AI to decide on allocation of social housing um, or indeed on building permits and a whole range of other things. So there's a number of different really real life um, applications of AI that are already starting to happen where there needs to be real accountability and public scrutiny for the products and services that AI puts into our lives. But of course, currently, both the technical expertise and much of the decision making on how to develop and deploy AI are in the hands of companies. Um, they're not, there's very little scrutiny and the algorithms which are, which are being developed are developed in something of a black box. Um, Margarita Vestager in her previous term as competition commissioner used to say, we need to send algorithms to law school. They need to understand what the Charter of, Human, of Fundamental Rights means at EU level. And at the moment, nobody makes sure that they are programmed in that way. So we need to make sure that the, the, that the AI actually reflects our values and particularly around the very problematic issue of the disproportionate negative effects that many uses of AI have on people who face discrimination. And that just take, takes me to my second point, which is that artificial intelligence is not neutral. Technology is never neutral. And AI, as the report points out, could create the most unequal societies we have ever seen. Now, we're used to these arguments about unequal access to digital, um, to AI and to digital skills, but it goes beyond that. It's the fact that AI and tech in general, it's not neutral, it's not objective, and it's not universal. It's deeply embedded in the social, political, and cultural context that it's developed in and that it interacts with. The way it's designed, the data it uses, the criteria for assessment, these all replicate the structural dis discriminations that permeate our society, including racism and all kinds of other sorts of bias. And because AI is more efficient than human decision making, it can exacerbate existing discrimination. And you can see this starting to happen already in law enforcement, migration, border control, access to public services, and essential private services, like, for example, access to credit. Now, o OSF has been supporting civil society organizations in Europe that are looking at this very issue, and just mention a few who are doing such a great job in documenting and, and denouncing uh, worrying examples that are coming up. There's EDRI, the Digital Freedom Fund, Access Now, Fair Trials International, and ENAR. 
And they've seen, for example, the way that in law enforcement, there's an increase in use of AI and algorithmically driven tools such as facial recognition and predicting police policing technologies that really can violate fundamental rights for everyone. Fundamental rights like the right to privacy, fair trial, the presumption of innocence. Um, and I'll just give you an example of one of the technological problems that facial recognition tech is 99% accurate when it scans the faces of white males. But when it's scanning the faces of women of color, it's only 34% accurate. And that has an enormous impact on, for example, policing, on border control, on the way that, um, that, that public services are delivered. Um, and it, in particular, we've seen, we've actually got numerous studies now, the way that the data feeding into predictive policing programs is historically biased which perpetuates the over-policing of racialized groups. So we need to make sure we address these structural discriminations at the very start. And I think a very helpful idea in the report is creating customer defending entities. The idea that you've got an entity that can analyze customer behavior with AI techniques to counterbalance the analytic power of corporations. And I wonder if the authors could have ref reflect on whether this could also be used to analyze bias and discrimination that is being built into AI right now. And I'll just finish with the point that, very important point that the report makes, that anticipating the evolution of AI is incredibly difficult, which is why we need to build the scaffolding for collective societal decision making into AI so that it's ready to deploy and that people can trust it. And for that to happen, people need to be involved and heard in that decision making process and preserve a sense of agency. Um, this is all the more important, um, given that, that automation and AI will actually cause people to work less and rely less on work for their economic and social needs. So this issue of trust in society becomes part of the fundamental contract between uh, the basic social contract between the state and the citizen, between people and the economy as well. And this is why we need the other things that the report talks about, impact assessments, monitoring, evaluation, and indeed well-being indicators, which I hope Anthony will talk about as well, having pioneered this area. I'll stop there, but lots of really fascinating points. Um, very welcome. So thanks to, very much to the authors for having thought through this amazing range of implications. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for, for your remarks on the study. Very, very, very pertinent. And uh, if I may make a, a kind of um, um, commercial and take the abuse of the situation, uh, the ADA committee will host a hearing on AI and bias and discrimination at uh, end of November, to which you're all very welcome. Um, with this, uh, I turn to our next speaker, uh, Andrea Render, uh, who's obviously a, a well known expert on EU regulatory affairs. He's uh, no stranger to the house either. We had him in our AIDA committee uh, recently. Uh, he's a senior research fellow at and uh, head of the unit on global governance, regulation, innovation, and the digital economy, the GRID, at the Center of European Policy Studies, CEPS. Um, and he's also a professor for uh, digital policy at the European University Institute, uh, UWE in Florence, and visiting professor of competition policy and the digital economy at the College of Europe. Um, Andrea, over to you for your thoughts on, on the study and how, how you see uh, the, uh, the takeaways and the actions as the authors set them out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, thanks to Vladimir and Jean-Philippe for their work and their uh, very uh, comprehensive, almost overwhelming uh, sort of uh, 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 study uh, of the prospects for the development of artificial intelligence. And also thanks to Heather for having uh, covered uh, quite a lot of ground in, in, uh, in our comments, which uh, helps me also being a little bit more selective in uh, picking some of the topics and uh, sort of add some flavor to, to this discussion. Now, first of all, uh, what do we imagine uh, human beings to become in the age of AI? Well, obviously, to answer this question, we need to know, uh, first of all, how AI is going to develop, and this is not easy to anticipate. But we could also, if you wish, observe uh, the way in which humans have adapted to technology in the past. Uh, let me pick the example of creativity, right? Um, the fact that uh, uh, the portrait of Edmond de Bellamy is sold, but actually that was the first time an AI uh, 
um, uh, let's say, made uh, uh, a piece of art was uh, auctioned, sold for such a high amount. And the fact that AI might give the impression of creativity, well, actually the, the reality of creativity, because it's an act of creation, uh, perhaps shouldn't be overestimated, meaning uh, the fact that technology can replicate what we do uh, is something that we've gotten used to over time for different things that humans do. If we heard the news today that a robot has beaten a human being at running the 100 meters, I think we would not perhaps be particularly surprised. Uh, but we also, if we look at uh, the way painters have adapted over time to the emergence of photography, uh, this gives us perhaps a little bit more of a hint on how humans might adapt uh, to uh, a new situation. The fact that we have now a technology that can replicate images perfectly because we have photography has led painters to gradually abstract from the pure act of mastering the uh, figurative arts, so really painting in a precise way how reality looks like. So painters have gradually uh, done, uh, you know, completed what we would, might call a Copernican revolution, actually a rebour, which is from the objectivity uh, of uh, uh, the figurative arts into the intention, the purpose, the emotions of the artist. Otherwise, people like, I don't know, Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko would never be considered as artists, right? So someone who just throws the paint at a canvas is not exactly the way in which Giotto considered himself to be a particularly masterful artist, right? So we change, we adapt, and perhaps we are pushed and our boundaries are pushed perhaps into even more what constitutes the nature of human beings by the fact that technology gradually supports and replaces us in a number of tasks. Uh, then uh, giving us time and opportunity to focus on what really makes us human. And uh, just to, to quote, perhaps to paraphrase, or to misquote Immanuel Kant, I would say we both need, uh, let's say, the starry sky above us, the ability to interpret reality and look at perhaps even the future and the moral law between us, so the ability to stick to our principles and values and to what really makes us human if we really want to master this particularly dangerous uh, uh, transition, but also a transition that is full of opportunities for us. So it's not just AI and creativity, but we know that AI, if properly used, can give us the opportunity to perhaps tackle a number of global and societal challenges that otherwise we would not have the opportunity to tackle properly. Um, is the current AI uh, the right set of technologies? Is the current evolution of AI what we really would need in that respect? Well, what I see observing digital technologies today is rather a, the world of unsustainability rather than the world of sustainability uh, for many reasons. Concentration of market power, uh, increased energy consumption, uh, as perhaps uh, uh, Laura will remind us, uh, some uh, 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 sort of imbalances in market power, loss of agency for some of the uh, participants to um, uh, production and consumption, and increasingly uh, the potential uh, creation of filter bubbles and echo chambers around us. <clears throat> now, um, is this the future? Well, if this is the future, then I perhaps am less optimistic than Vladimir on a number of issues. And uh, if this is the future, perhaps we need to take action. Um, it might not be the future for a couple of reasons, and I will mention two things that I think will happen over the coming years. So the first is the fact that the current developments in AI are extremely data hungry, right? We are, uh, as, a, as a result of the first three decades of the internet economy, the full digitization of our lives, we have had the availability of enormous amounts of data, which have fed into and created demand for very data hungry, uh, very inefficiently learning, if you wish, uh, systems of AI, uh, which we call machine learning and their sub variants. But we increasingly see that in order to increase accuracy on those models, uh, we need to invest enormous amounts of money to get incremental increases. And so it seems that the, the in, increased data demands for these systems and uh, this you know, striving for accuracy is about to hit a wall, which means the future of AI will probably be a blend of techniques, which uh, goes in the direction of using as much data as it's possible, but also using smaller data whenever possible. And also coupling this with what we call Bayesian programming or probabilistic programming, which is something that how reproduces a little bit the functioning of the human brain with a number of other challenges that we will face over time. Now, is this new generation of AI systems, will it help us and will it interact with us in a different way? I think this is a good topic for EPRS and STOA 
uh, for, uh, for future panels. The second thing that I'd like to highlight, I'll set aside for a second improvements in uh, computational capacity, which are equally important, um, but it's the IoT revolution. Uh, today we have approximately 8 billion connected devices at the global level. Uh, the um, projection for 2035, don't take it at face value, obviously, because these are always tentative, is 1 trillion devices connected. So if you start imagining yourselves, what does it mean to live in a world with 1 trillion connected devices? And unfortunately, not even globally distributed, but mostly concentrated in the north of the world. And this is another problem that we might talk about later. Well, this means that on top of the four natural elements, we will have a fifth element around us. It's, it's an information and data envelope that will be mediating between us as human beings and the rest of the world. This, I think, will be a key problem uh, because it will require policymakers to really develop new tools and master the technology itself in order to really understand how to build a bridge between those two spheres and how to protect uh, human rights uh, and uh, uh, human agency in this uh, changing context. So what are the risks that we see and, uh, and how to face them? Of course, I will try to be very short, uh, but I saw Risto, for example, asking a question on the chat. So in my last minute, I'll try perhaps to tackle that as well. Uh, we have the proposed AI Act, which I think is a very good start. I think someone had to table the discussion, uh, and it seems pretty clear to us from this discussion that something has to be done in regulatory terms without necessarily uh, you know, constraining too much AI development. But the future, the way I see it, will be a future of more pervasive AI uh, and what we call multi-AI situations. So one thing is to talk about a linear situation in which someone develops deploys an AI system, and this causes a potential risk or damage to an individual that then might have redress. And that's already pretty difficult to do. In a situation in which um, damage can be caused by the interaction of different AI systems and their interaction with human beings is a situation in which we certainly don't uh, solve the problem with exante conformity assessments, right? So we need to have a system of some, somehow real-time monitoring of how AI behaves and interacts with other AI systems. Auditors are working on real-time audits. Policymakers increasingly work on subtech and govtech technologies. So the role of government and the role of third parties, whenever governments will not be able to get there, think about workers having access to the algorithms that manage that and monitor them. The role of these third parties, including government, will actually be that of being able to control, monitor situations, and intervene in real time, preserving their agency, uh, as opposed to a situation in which AI is something that is done to them, uh, which is absolutely impossible for us to develop as human beings. Uh, so interactive, interactive risks, epistemic risks, systemic risks, including those of democracy, are all risks that are not fully tackled by the AI Act. And I think in order to tackle them, we would need to do something, and this is my last sentence before Marcus gets worried, um, we would need to do something that is extremely important, and this is for the parliament in the first place at this moment, understanding that the AI Act cannot be a hyper-prescriptive piece of regulation as it stands today, that most of our trust in the system will have to be shifted on the situation in which AI has been deployed on the market and starts interacting with the external environment, including other AI systems. This requires strong governance and a type of governance and a number of tools that we're only starting to imagine and design today. So we all will need to think about it together before uh, our utopia of AI that empowers us uh, transforms into a very widespread dystopia of how AI is gonna kill us. Thanks, Marcus, over to you. Thank you, Andrea. Very, very fascinating. I, I hesitate to interrupt you. I could listen to you for, for hours, but we don't have the time, time today. But I'm sure we'll discuss further during our debate. Um, let me turn to, to our next speaker. Again, uh, uh, a close friend to the European Parliament and obviously an expert in the EU area. Uh, Anthony Gucci, uh, Director for Public Affairs and Communications at the OECD in Paris. Uh, Director of the OECD Forum and Coordinator of the OECD Global Parliamentary Network. Um, and also uh, 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 um, a very long lasting experience in the EU as uh, Anthony, you spent, I think, 14 years with DG Trade working on trade questions um, uh, in, in the EU. Um, 
Anthony, I, I know that the uh, OECD has been doing lots of work on AI, partially together with the European Parliament and in other areas. Uh, where, where do you see, can the OECD effectively contribute most at the global, at the international level uh, to, to prepare our society for the, for the future of AI, bearing in mind the activities you're, you're already undertaking? Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. Thanks to you, to Anthony, to Eva for convening uh, this, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to Vladimir and Jean-Philippe for a super report, very, very timely. And to my fellow panelists, uh, loads of ideas already buzzing around in my head, which makes what I'm going to say, I'm going to try and focus. Um, but um, a, lot of, a lot of food for thought. And I, I, I want to pick up on what uh, Vladimir said about the future not being written, uh, being able to write it. Um, I think probably one of the, the key elements that I want to bring across here, it may seem a bit starry eyed, is we have agency. Uh, we know as human beings that agency can take us in different directions. And I think that the, the job we have collectively uh, in gatherings like this is to, to see the extent to which we can indeed um, uh, do everything we can collectively to guide, our, guide, and guide ourselves in the, in the right direction and try and, and stay, uh, steer clear of what's more problematic. And I think it's easier from an OECD vantage point to dwell uh, perhaps uh, on, that, um, or, or, or on that side of things. And uh, the invitation um, uh, is already provided by, uh, by Vladimir and Jean-Philippe in, in what they uh, wrote. And I thought the, the report was, was excellent. And also uh, Heather uh, mentioning work uh, that we've done um, regarding what I consider to be the most fundamental outcome of public policy and what we're all involved in, and that's actually trying to generate well-being uh, for ourselves and for, for citizens uh, uh, globally. Um, I mean, we're talking here about something that's eminently uh, existential, the future of humanity and AI, and, and it is. Um, and and the, we're talking about a general purpose technology. What does that mean? Of course, it means that it, it is at once hugely significant in terms of societal implications. You have to fly at 35,000 feet. And at the same time, it takes you into nooks and crannies, uh, deep technical and technological ramifications. And I think one of the big things we have to do is see how we can uh, adjust uh, from going to certain from certain levels to other levels, but never losing sight of the overall uh, uh, goal. Uh, it is very, very clear also that um, everything has been accelerated and amplified in this period that we're living now certainly the, the covid period i think has uh put everything on speed uh so the acceleration and amplification of the digitalization of our societies uh we've been seeing that in all sorts of fields and i'm going to come come back to it but i think what it what it uh, um uh, does is is, is bring uh, the issues that, that vladimir and, and jean philippe have uh, crystallized so well really to to the forefront of, uh, of our activity first thing i want to dwell on is outcomes because i think that's the thing in a sense that we we need to try and uh, it's almost like a compass, uh, fix your north and the outcomes that we are seeking. Uh, and on that score, um, I want quickly maybe uh, to give people a sense uh, of um, what was uh, referred to uh, by um, uh, Jean, uh, Philippe and, and by Vladimir, which is the uh, uh, OECD's work on uh, uh, well-being. Now, um, this actually came out of uh, um, a pretty important moment, uh, which was the global financial crisis of 2008. And uh, probably if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't necessarily have ventured into this terrain. But at that point in time, very clear wake up call to, to all of us uh, to actually focus on what uh, well-being uh, actually consists of uh, beyond uh, GDP. Uh, and so um, from the ashes of the global financial crisis, we developed an initiative and an index uh, focusing on uh, the dimensions that you can see here. It's not all inclusive, uh, but we were trying to distill key elements of well-being. They cover both quality of life and uh, material elements of uh, uh, well-being. And you can see uh, in here uh, what we developed uh, at that point uh, in time. The key element also was that what we wanted to do, to do significantly was uh, put our focus squarely on people, on humans. And that's the humanity uh, element, the title of the report we're discussing today. We wanted to move beyond economic systems that were supposed to serve them, uh, but with a, such a focus, for example, on GDP, it's almost like GDP became the outcome as opposed to uh, what it was designed to uh, achieve. 
And uh, uh, the, the challenge, of course, that we have uh, now uh, is that uh, people's well-being has gained a central role in policy discussions and debates, but the notion of well-being needs to be rethought and recast in the light of the digital acceleration, the amplification and transformation of our societies that has only uh, um, grown uh, uh, exponentially uh, since 2020. And so to take up uh, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir's uh, uh, report in Action 3, to take the OECD uh, definitions of well-being as starting points, I'm actually going to do that and uh, say that we recognize and realize that what we did back then isn't enough for now. Uh, so what we need to do is take account of the impact of digitalization and associated uh, technologies. Uh, and we're starting to do that. We've been uh, uh, working on this for a little while to try and shed light on uh, what is quality of life uh, in a digital age. Uh, the different dimensions of our framework have important digital ramifications, generating new opportunities, but also risks. Uh, and uh, the flower that you saw initially of, of well-being, uh, that um, uh, now we are in a position where we have to uh, adjust it and uh, make it uh, relevant to the environment that we're in now. And I want to take uh, three uh, examples of that, uh, if I may. Um, the first one, and I hope you've actually been able to see the visual so far. If you haven't, apologies. I'm trying to work with different technologies uh, uh, here. Uh, let me take uh, health to start with. Um, now, healthcare uh, delivery uh, is affected by new technologies, the production and use of medical data, new treatment options, telecare, teleconsultation. Uh, but the extreme use of digital technologies, especially among children and teenagers that a number of speakers have already alluded to, uh, that can generate mental health problems and crowd out other activities such uh, as physical exercise. So part of what we have to do with our framework is actually um, make it fit for purpose for this digital age in order to measure what we treasure and be able uh, to provide guidance to policymakers uh, and legislators accordingly. Um, beyond health, two other key dimensions, work-life balance, and jobs. Digital technologies have facilitated teleworking arrangements. Don't we know it? We're lucky uh, in that sense. Others haven't been so lucky. Uh, and an opportunity to find a better balance between personal and professional lives. And at the same time, these technologies are also changing the type of tasks performed in most jobs, increasing the potential for automation. A digital well-being is much more than just reducing screen time. Uh, these technologies can expand the boundaries of information availability and enhance human productivity, but they can imply uh, risks for people's well-being, ranging from cyberbullying to the emergence of disinformation or cyber hacking. And in addition, inequalities along age, gender, and socioeconomic lines uh, in the access and use of digital technologies mean certain groups are better able to use them uh, for higher well-being outcomes. And as we've heard, uh, we also have uh, groups uh, that uh, uh, see far uh, different outcomes, uh, in perpetuation of existing biases and a disparate impact on vulnerable and underrepresented uh, populations such as ethnic minorities, women, children, the elderly, uh, the less educated and the low skilled. Okay, so how do we foster technological information innovation whilst ensuring better lives? Uh, promoting a human centric approach to AI is a big part of that answer. And uh, building on what we what the EU did, um, this is part of what the OECD I think can bring Marcus is going global. So we took uh, and participated very strongly in the EU's work on AI principles. And we developed uh, principles from an OECD vantage point uh, that meant that we've now actually got uh, almost 50 signatories uh, worldwide uh, to these principles. So uh, this is, a, uh, I think, a very important element because in the, in the same way that Vladimir cited UNESCO, and I fully agree with him on the importance of working very closely together with them, uh, the, the elements that we're, we're developing uh, that are often developed, uh, developed and started at the EU, uh, they have this capacity to then uh, take on uh, uh, global ramifications and the sorts of things that many uh, feel comfortable uh, uh, signing up to uh, and with. And uh, one of the key uh, terms inside that is trustworthiness that Heather uh, cited uh, in order to contribute to overall growth and prosperity uh, for all uh, uh, individuals um, uh, in society and the planet. And these international standards uh, promote the development and use of AI that's trustworthy, respects human rights and uh, democratic uh, values. Now, um, I say that's all very well. Uh, the big challenge is uh, how to get uh, to a point where we can actually go from this dream uh, to a reality. And here, 
Um, I'd like to pick up on one of the recommendations that Vladimir was making, talking about uh, new skills for those in public administration. I actually think one of the key areas, and that's the one that we're working on so closely with our friends at the European Parliament, is developing new skills for legislators, because I think legislators are critical in this whole game. They represent people. They are the bedrock of our uh, democratic systems, the ones that may get er eroded. They're at the hard end. They're the ones who get the short term pressures. Uh, what do we do about facial recognition, driverless cars? They, people want action quickly. There's a lot of pressure on them. And I think we have to work hand in glove with them to provide them with the elements that allow them to do their job as effectively as possible, keeping those long term outcomes and goals uh, that we have uh, uppermost in their minds, whilst at the same time managing the short term pressures that are going to come along and ever cited the democratic alliance standards and the need for implementation. And the, the global element, because with the general purpose technology, whatever we do, we've got to make it globally relevant. It's not easy. And Vladimir and Jean-Philippe put their finger on the challenges in terms of definitions and the rest. But we are uh, moving in this respect. And I do think that going global with the principles, the actions and the implementation that we're taking is going to be uh, a key uh, factor in this. And I think that legislators are critical as well because we're able to capture the different political hues try and provide evidence base uh, and um, provide them with also the, the elements that we are seeing as best practice uh, around the world. How are legislators in different places uh, fronting up to the pressures that they're, with, the, 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 that they're being put under? And what to, can this provide to those who are uh, confronting similar pressures? And there we're going to be working on an AI legislative observatory precisely to achieve this goal. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing that hand in glove with the, uh, the European Parliament. Um, just as a final point, um, this can all sound starry eyed and well, this is all very well principles and implementation and the rest, but you know, uh, the risks are so high and everything else. I want to signal hope uh, from two areas that we've worked on. I think it's all, always good to look at your past and what you've achieved. The first one is pretty recent, and I think many of you know it, and that is tax. Now, when I mention the word tax, there's nothing that connotes sovereignty more than tax. You know, it's the definition of a state, raising taxes and declaring war. There's also nothing that probably connotes the connection between the citizen, the individual, and the state than tax. Now, if I'd said to you back in 2007, we're gonna manage to get a global minimum tax rate of 15% all over the world, and we're gonna get all of the major multinationals uh, who, as you know, through COVID have also done extremely well, uh, to leave a significant proportion of their profits in tax in every single country where they generate it, you'd have all laughed at me. And you'd have been right. And yet, hopefully, in three weeks' time, that's what the G20, the OECD, and the global community that we brought together might be able to achieve. So I'm saying e each one of these things is bloody hard to do. It's taken us a hell of a long time to do things. But we know that we, when we set our minds to things, we can actually achieve them. And the other element is picking up on education. You know that the OECD is very strong in that field. We are placing heavy emphasis on exactly the skills that Vladimir was pointing to, the EMC squared, empathy and mindfulness. These are now critical uh, determinants of rankings, of our key rankings for the future. And those rankings are rather influential in terms of policy and everybody around the world wants to be top of them. I mean, everybody, look at, we've got 100 countries involved in this stuff. On tax, we've got 140 countries. So on that happy note, and sorry for taking a little bit too long, and back to Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for, for, for outlining what the OECD is doing all this area. It's, it's very promising to see how, how the OECD is, is um, complementing the work of the European Parliament at global level and addressing the, uh, uh, the, the recommendations also of the report and the findings already, that you're already working on it. It's, it's uh, very comforting to hear that, that you are already on it. Um, with this, I introduce our last speaker, I already um, uh, make an announcement uh, with the last speaker, we will close the Q&A, so if you have a last question, please uh, send them on, we have five questions so far, and I will address them back to the, uh, to the authors and the other panelists. Um, so now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Laura Nursky from, uh, from Bruegel, the think tank, she's a research fellow there, uh, she works on the Future of Work and Exclusive, Inclusive Growth, growth Project. Uh, which analyzed the impact of AI on work, welfare, and, and growth, uh, which is uh, very uh, topical 
and uh, ties in well with uh, the work of the OECD that Anthony just outlined. Um, she worked also uh, as a data scientist in the financial and retail sector and is a statistical programmer. With this, uh, over to you, Laura. Uh, tell us about your work on the on the future of work and AI. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be part of this excellent group of uh, researchers and policy experts. Uh, I enjoyed the report by Vladimir and uh, Jean-Philippe very much. And um, uh, as you heard from the previous discussions already, the report covers many, uh, many important issues and there's a lot uh, to grasp and to potentially discuss today. But given the limited amount of time that we have, I just want to make uh, two points and I'll speak from two perspectives uh, as Marcus uh, correctly uh, introduced. Uh, as a labor economist, I want to focus on AI systems in the workplace, which, as you know, is currently classified as high risk uh, systems. But also as a former data scientist, I want to get down into the inner workings of uh, algorithmic decision making. So the report takes off by redefining intelligence. And I see that the discussion is also taking place in the Q&A chat on what intelligence or artificial intelligence means. And the definition I always use is that uh, intelligence is the ability uh, to retrieve information from your environment, uh, synthesize that information into knowledge, and then apply that knowledge uh, to make an informed decision to interact with your environment. And it's, it's called only artificial when it's done by a piece of code instead of by a human. And in that sense, AI is, is similar to other decision-making tools and heuristics that we use, uh, most of which are actually inherently flawed because decision-making is just notoriously hard. We humans struggle with it as well. And that's because uh, decision-making is basically an optimization exercise. So when you are looking for an optimal decision, you always have to decide what, it, what exactly it is that you want to optimize. So for algorithms, that's usually either minimizing or maximizing some target, minimizing idle times or default risks or maximizing click-through rates or the time you spend on a platform. And these are the targets that the algorithm is designed to optimize. And as a consequence, everything that you don't include in this list of targets is ignored by the algorithm or even squeezed out at the expense of the things that you do include in the list of targets. So what is typically not included in this target list are nonprofit concerns that have been mentioned before, like environmental concerns, social, psychological well-being issues. And when we translate this to the workplace, for example, this means that a scheduling algorithm might have as a target to cut labor costs by responding just in time to the needs of the business. But this efficiency then comes at the expense of, for example, the work-life balance of its employees if you do not explicitly code this as a target in your algorithm. So indeed, as the report states in, in its fourth takeaway, good intentions will not prevent AI from having disruptive effects. And that's because unintended side effects, they are always a result of optimizing one thing over another. Now, the upside to this optimization story is that it's currently still humans who get to decide what goes into this list of targets for the algorithm to optimize. And in my opinion, there's no reason that uh, indicators on job quality or well-being cannot be included as parameters in algorithms. I'm thinking now, for example, of parameters such as the time in between shifts, the number of hours worked per week or the number of weekends off per month. It's actually our responsibility as employers and AI designers to put those targets in there for the algorithm to optimize. And actually the same goes for the risk assessments. So the current draft regulation requires risk assessments for high risk uh, AI applications, uh, but it mainly emphasizes the safety, health and human rights risks. And personally, I would like to see also the risk for harming well-being at work and job quality uh, explicitly included in those risk assessments. So that was my first point. Uh, what are algorithms designed to optimize? And let's make sure that we put the right targets there. Uh, translated to the workplace, that means metrics for job quality and well-being at work. So then the second point I want to make is even if we give the algorithm the right targets, how much decision making do we actually want to hand over to algorithms? So um, as humans controlling our environment and making decisions about our actions and bearing the consequences of those decisions, those are all essential parts of uh, what it means to be human. Um, and as the report states in its uh, takeaway number six, let's be careful about the loss of free will and the ability to make decisions for ourselves. So both the 
power to make decisions, like auton which is autonomy, uh, and the ability to, to make decisions, which is skills. Uh, both of those are essential parts of life and uh, work. And the, the impact of AI on both of them is undeniable. So taking away a worker's control over his working time, his working methods, or the pace and schedule of his tasks, that turns an interesting job into a boring one and a motivated worker into a disengaged one. It also bears the risk of de-skilling. So there's this by now infamous example of airplane pilots, extreme reliance on autopilot technologies, which reduced their manual flying skills um, and ended in a deadly crash as a result of that. So since 2013, the American Aviation Administration now recommends that pilots actually keep practicing their flying, uh, manual flying uh, to avoid the skill loss. So the point here is if we stop making decisions and stop practicing after a while, we will no longer be able to. And besides the harm that this brings to the quality of a product or a service, like a plane crash, that's terrible quality if you want to, to make a flight, this de-skilling and loss of job control, it also harm, harms the worker himself. So both autonomy and skill development, they are important aspects of job quality and well-being at work. When they are uh, available to workers, they contribute to motivation and they can even act as a buffer to work stress. But when taken away, their absence leads to disengagement and burnout in the workplace. So that was the second point I wanted to make. Let's think carefully about the decisions that we want to keep making ourselves, uh, that we want to keep practicing, um, and which decisions that we want to uh, that we feel comfortable handing over to AI. So in the workplace, that means which decision making is engaging, motivating, uh, contributing to your skill development, making you grow, and which decision making is just stressful and difficult, and you're glad to get rid of it. So now talking about all these risks, I don't mean to ignore the potential benefits uh, that AI could bring to workers and workplaces especially in terms of increasing labor productivity, making workplaces safer and creating new industries and employments. We just need to make sure that we protect uh, workers along the way. So when we were preparing this uh, event, Andrea asked me then, then what exactly should be done to protect workers? So I, I wanted to give him an answer uh, in this uh, conclusion. So most urgently for the near future, that was the first point I made and we should ask ourselves the following questions. What is being optimized by the algorithm in the workplace? Can we include job quality in that list of targets? Which risks are being assessed? Can we include well-being risks in the risk assessment for high-risk AI systems? Who oversees the algorithm? Can we give worker representatives a say in this oversight? And finally, who can overrule the al algorithm? Where can workers go for recourse when exposed to algorithmic harm? Now, looking further ahead into the future, as this report also has uh, focused extensively on thinking about designing AI, AI systems that help uh, humanity and workers to flourish in the long run. Well, then I return to my second point and the following questions. Which decisions do we want to keep making ourselves because they allow us to grow and impact our surroundings? Which decisions do we want to hand over to AI because they're stressful or difficult? And more broadly, how is AI impacting the role of work in providing a meaningful way for growing your skills and connecting with people? And I think if we can answer these questions, that we are ready to develop AI that supports, supports workers and jobs and humanity and society at large. That is an amazing conclusion, Laura. <laughs> that if that we if we can solve that, then uh, then our job is done. Um, we received a few questions uh, from the audience. We have roughly well maybe 20, 25 minutes uh, uh, left. If we can go a bit over time, um, I would address them first of all. Some back to to the author there because they were the authors because they were specifically addressed uh, to them. Uh, since Jean Philippe, you were not able to collect uh, connect earlier, then maybe you want to come in on some of these questions, and then Vladimir will, may want to compliment. Um, so, on on the, the first questions, um, uh, one question is: uh, How can AI be mobilized to protect us from cyber threats, uh, from technologies such as quantum computing, and set from the threats of AI itself? Uh, and and then the other question: Whether uh, artificial immortality uh, present an existential threat to to humanity itself? Um, and maybe connected to that, there's another question on whether you could more uh, elaborate further on the concept of superhumans in the report. Uh, what what would it mean to be to be superhuman? Um, 
Uh, and then the creativity question, I think Andrea Render already touched upon them and, and Vladimir in the introduction, but maybe the authors and others can come in on that. Uh, how how much human intervention is involved in AI that we can call actually creativity as a human designs, programs and trains the algorithm and selects the output. Meanwhile, the AI does not really know what they are actually doing, the concept. They don't know that they're painting. They don't know what the piece of art is. So it's still wouldn't that still be human creativity? Uh, um, isn't, isn't the, the idea to, to claim that AI is creative, is, is that a, a way of making the AI, AI sound more human than it actually is? Uh, with that, I would start with uh, Jean-Philippe, maybe. Thank you. And maybe if you allow me, I will also link that to a um, discussion that was going on on the chat on intelligence, actually, if intelligence is the right word because I, for, for artificial intelligence, because I think that's really very much linked to this question of creativity. So I'm going to improvise a little bit because I, I did not hear what Vlado said earlier, so I hope I won't repeat too much of what he already said. What's important to really highlight is that we still don't know very little about how the human brain functions and even less about the link between brain and mind. As a result of this, there is at this stage no consensus at scientific level about many of the fundamental concepts, such as consciousness, for example, and also intelligence. This makes it incredibly difficult to compare artificial and human intelligence. Where there is a consensus, what we do know is that they are already very different from each other, and this difference will increase. And the reason is that sensations, emotions, consciousness were at the center of the development of human intelligence. Machines do not need it. This does not mean that one be able to, to develop some kind of sensations, emotions, or consciousness. And a lot of research is going on in labs to do this, but they don't need it. Which and this means actually that and we really, I think, underestimate this, that artificial intelligence is already very counterintuitive for human being, and it will become even further so in the years to come. Very often we speak about transparency of algorithms. We say, if we put data A in a machine, we ask question B, we get answer C, uh, C we want to know what happened between B and C. But more and more what's going to happen is we are basically putting data A in the machine, asking question B, and actually the answer C is a valid answer, but it's already too different for us to really basically understand it. And that's a major change which we underestimate. And this brings me to the question of, of creativity. And I trust that Vladimir explained that for many years already machines uh, basically um, can be creative. Uh, probably he also mentioned that one of the hypest fields of research right now in the AI field is about what is so-called open-endedness and curiosity in AI, which basically means we are at the point where when we put data A in a machine, we no longer ask the question. We ask the machine to invent the question. So I think, you know, we are progressively going very far we will progressively go very far away you know from basically just replicating or you know what human intelligence was or replicating what humans are able to do or even in the field of arts just replicating basically what what uh, humans uh, um, are, are able to do uh, just maybe link to that two two further short comments um you know, the most amazing examples we heard from came from the quantum community and there are some, some researchers there told us that basically they already used AI to invent research experiments. They said because if it's humans designing the experiments, they are limited by their knowledge and their human intuition. Machines have no such limitations. And therefore machines came up with totally new experiment proposals which open tremendous new uh, perspectives for, for researchers. So that's something that really will be developed tremendously in the, in the years to come. And just maybe to, to finish on, on art, can machines be considered as artists? Actually, it's very funny. When you listen to music, basically 
created by a machine, or you watch a painting created by a machine, if you don't know it, it's very, very difficult to make a difference. If you know it was designed by a machine, all of a sudden you feel that it lacks something. Huh? The conclusion is, yeah, it's very nice, but very often we say it lacks soul, most often, or it lacks some kind of authentic human experience. But basically the question if machines can be artists is no longer a scientific question, it's much more a philosophical question. And maybe I, I leave it to Vladimir to answer the other questions because I fear I will repeat too much of what he said a little bit earlier. Maybe Vladimir, briefly, if you can come in on the AI, how to protect us from cyber threats uh, and the question on artificial immortality. Yeah, <clears throat> what uh, what uh, uh, we already put in, in, in the paper is, is uh, fr from our perspective, is, is naive to think that the transparency of algorithms, uh, transparency of data or all, all those aspects are going to bring uh, any solution. We simply are not able to to cope with with all those things, and uh, and algorithm even even those creating algorithms uh, they don't understand fully how they fun function <clears throat> already now. So it's an, as 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 Jean Philippe is saying, uh, it's not linear, and it it will be increasingly increasingly uh, non-linear in the future, and we will be will be getting into into issues which we are not even thinking of. And we can't even imagine because it's our limitation. So I think that from that perspective, we need to look also at the, at the remedies at, the, at, at all those uh, all those elements which may help us to to navigate uh, uh, and and to to innovate, enhance our capacity to 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 protect ourselves. Uh, and, and I think that there is all notion, and I think that that's very very far developed already. All this uh, all all this idea of uh, um, uh, guardian angels. So then we might have a personal AI device, personal AI system, which we can in in a way set in in a way according to our preferences, according to our uh, our <clears throat> uh, values, our our culture, the the norms in the society. What is good and what is wrong for us, and, and where this uh, th this warning should be should be coming, and that can be. It can go that far that can be even emotional <clears throat> that this system is trying to manipulate your emotion or this system is trying to, to do the profiling. So I think that from, from that point of view, as we have now the programs, these antivirus programs, which are integral part of, of our computers and, and without them, we would not be able to, to use uh, our network and, and PCs. Uh, the, the same is is going to happen, and it's it's it's, devel it's in development in this field. So that that is that's quite sure. And maybe maybe one more very short comment on on what Andrea was was saying. <clears throat> I I fully agree that uh, I, I would say that uh, from my perspective, this uh, direct or th these regulations or this this package of of April should be the last package of this uh, old type of policy making. I think that what we need to invent is is a new policy making. We need to have a system of sensors and very flexible way of responding to uh, to the challenges because this is, as I mentioned, non-linear. And if we go in 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 forward in this linear way, so we would not be going very far. <clears throat> so I think that this is uh, something we need to work uh, uh, very hard on. It's tough. <clears throat> it's it's completely changing the, the system of uh, of policy making, but we need to go this way. And, and, I, and I hope that the European Parliament may be front runner in in this respect and and to uh, to to push uh, maybe um, other other partners to to start with some experimentation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, I'm afraid we are shortly running out of time, so I want to give each of you the, the floor to, to briefly react to what you have heard and some of the questions uh, which are in the chat and which haven't already answered yet. I would suggest to start in the same order as, as we started before, uh, um, and I would kindly ask you to stick to four minutes each. Uh, um, may I start with, with uh, suggest that Heather uh, starts, please, um, for four minutes. Well. Thank you. Um, I also need to go, unfortunately, so I won't even give you four minutes. I think the key thing is that um, 
we are probably we are redefining the whole term of intelligence um and uh artificial intelligence is is not really um intelligence it's a way of learning how to do something um and it's uh, particularly machine learning i think is a very helpful term and automated decision making so i think we will quite soon be breaking down the term artificial intelligence into much more specific uh terminology to explain what it is we're actually talking about and that's incredibly important for demystifying the subject and allowing um people to come in um you know for a much broader more inclusive decision making where a lot of people from many different sectors and many different parts of society are able to take part so i think it would be very you know even an algorithm that sounds like a scary rather technical thing it's simply um a process an algorithm is a process that you work through um and it's it's a uh, it's this kind of thing that we use all the time um, in, in daily life. It's just that in this case, it happens to be a machine that is working through a particular process, like it would with a math problem or even with a shopping list. Um, so I think those are that's that's one key point. But then the second one I just wanted to, to really make is about um, the whole point of regulation, because, you know, the EU has now taken some very important steps with this proposal of the Artificial Intelligence Act. Um, and, you know, the EU is leading the world on this. It's really setting the norms that will be affecting the way that the rest of the world does it because it's far further ahead than our other jurisdictions, including the United States, including China. So if, if it is able to establish regulation that um, that confirms trustworthy AI and a human centered approach to technology, that would be fantastic. In our view, the proposal is not bold enough. Uh, for example, I think that um, it needs to look at, um, it needs to ban AI uses that are contrary to fundamental rights, like predictive and behavioral policing systems and, and so on. And also it's really important that the bur burden of proof is that an AI system, um, the, the burden of proof needs to lie on those deploying um, the AI system, not those on the receiving end. But still, it is very forward looking. And I think the key thing in, in the debate that's going to be had across Europe about the AI Act is that technology needs to adapt to our values, not the other way around. It needs to adapt to us as human beings with our complexity and sometimes our confusion, but also with our um, instincts such as justice, our instincts such as uh, social bonding and inclusion. Um, of of uh, all of those in a group, um, and regulation needs to think about what um, what kind of map it's setting out for the market to take. Ultimately, that's what regulation can do. It can set out a red uh, um, a roadmap that indicates sets incentives, but and, and constraints, but also gives a vision for um, for companies that that are interested in innovation, but also also for society. And we need to tell the market where we want innovation to happen for the benefit of people and that's ultimately what what the eu needs to do so it's very important to have this kind of a broad and inclusive debate and, and think about all these things and also then to um in, engage directly with what's happening at eu level because this is the eu is creating the norms just as with gdpr uh, it's creating the norms that the rest of the world will follow for better or for worse so let's design them really well thank you Thank you, Heather. That's an excellent appeal to to the EU lawmakers and to the European Parliament to to do their homework and for 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 our members to to work uh, thoroughly on the AI Act. Uh, I'll move on to to Andrea. Andrea Renda for your for your closing remarks. Yes, Marcus. I spoke a little bit longer before, so I shall be shorter now than the, than the four minutes. Uh, I just uh, want to say two things. First of all, tapping into the debate on intelligence, as I wrote in the chat, for me, intelligence is. Uh, uh really the etymological meaning of intelligence the ability to read inside things into legere which means awareness of the context and uh, sense of purpose and uh, uh this we don't see uh in uh, the current developments in artificial intelligence and uh, I, I want to get really back to this because i think one day perhaps in a couple of years uh, in two in three years we will start a debate about what is the ultimate purpose collectively of mankind and see whether artificial intelligence can be aligned with that it is the preservation of our species perhaps can artificial intelligence be redirected towards this what i know being originally an economist is that if we put artificial intelligence and the optimization of the of the function that ai needs to optimize uh, we put it in the hands for example of an economist that would be a recipe for disaster. Things like maximizing social welfare or maximizing GDP 
mankind will be severely uh, threatened uh, because the, some of these actions can be achieved much better without um, uh, human beings. Now, when it comes to policy making, and the second thing that I wanted to say uh, is um, the, the uh, what needs to be done at this moment is something that scholars have been studying for a long time on aspects that we call adaptive regulation in case of risk, uh, constantly evolving risks, or uh, uh, anticipatory policy making and experimental policy making. So it's going to be very complicated to create a system that is uh, sufficiently trustworthy, uh, that it sort of departs from an early input in legislation and then evolves into something that is able to spread regulatory certainty uh, in al almost in real time. And, but in order to do this, and I think we need to do this, we would need something more than an AI board that looks like the council, like a, a one representative per member state. We need experts. We need stakeholders, civil society involved, and we need a system to uh, to really uh, socialize, democratize the not every single uh, function of every single AI system, but the general direction that AI takes. Um, quick footnote is AI, as everybody agrees, has a great potential for uh, uh, the big challenges, existential challenges that we have uh, ahead of us. Look at the investments today, military developments, uh, or AI investments that go into a better recommendation engine or a smartphone that snaps a better selfie are the dom dominant ones. Uh, I don't think these are the ones that we need uh, to put AI to the best possible use. So I think we need to reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for that. Uh, and, and also for, for reminding us what intelligence means and artificial actually means and that we are probably not working with the right terminology. I know some colleagues in store are very delighted to hear that because that was also what they, they said in an excellent study they produced. Um, with that, over to you, Anthony. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much. Um, a huge amount of food for thought though, in terms of uh, what I've heard from, from the different speakers this afternoon. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we've got to um, answer in this whole uh, game is what does it mean to be human today? Um, so I think that's something that, um, you know, we can, we have to probably recognize that a lot of what humanity has done over quite a long time has perhaps been trying to be a little bit like machines. I know this may sound heretical from someone coming from the OECD, but, you know, a f an excessive focus on productivity, which you can uh, connect very much, and this picks up on and Andrea's last point with economists, you know, can actually take you towards that um, that that thing, which is you actually end up trying to trying to be machine like rather than actually what you what makes you eminently uh, uh, human. Now, I think connected to uh, what it means to be human is an exercise in developing uh, values for a digital world and universal values for a digital world. Now, I'm not saying this is a particularly easy time to get everyone around the, the global table in peace and love. Uh, to sit down and sort of try and do a sort of UN charter for the digital age. However, I think that we ain't got much choice. Now, the manner in which we can do it, we can, I think we should be clever. And I think some of the discussions that we may have uh, in contexts like this, which are very, where, where we're comfortable with terms, even if we, we don't agree on everything, but we know the ballpark, which is the use of the term values. We also know that when we sit down with others, perhaps in other parts of the world, uh, that term values can fall into the, the the basket of we're projecting ourselves on onto other people. I experienced that a lot when uh, I was negotiating international agreements on behalf of the EU. And I'm not talking about sitting down with China. I'm talking about sitting down with countries in Latin America or never being able to sit down with countries like Australia because we weren't able to negotiate a human rights clause when we uh, when we started. That may raise a lot of eyebrows, but that you know that's what the the, the game that we are uh, in. And again. I think legislators have a really, really important role in all of this, because I don't think we should just kick it up to experts or kick it over to constitutionalists. You've got to stay in touch also with what, what the human market will bear. And that's not easy, but I, I think we have to do that. And there has to be a process, not just of, um, I don't know, amplifying the worst. There is an educative process or there is a pedagogical pro uh, process. What's at stake? But I do think that you can, uh, develop collective intelligence and, and that is where you know you try and take what we can all bring together collectively collective human intelligence and feed that in in order to be able to to, to deliver uh, better results and i love what laura was saying about 
uh, feed this into the algorithms because we, we, we're damn sight more likely to ensure that we keep to our um, lofty aims if we actually put it in the hands of something that will really do it rather than us who are great at talking a good game and then when it comes to playing we don't always uh, meet our expectations. The last point I wanted to make regards delegation. And I think uh, I think Laura said, oh, well, we should leave the very difficult um, decisions up to the algorithm. Um, I, maybe you didn't mean it in that way, but I think the very difficult decisions we cannot leave up to AI. The very difficult decisions are very difficult. And of course, we don't like them. They're a bummer, but that's the reason we have to get our heads around them. That's the reason we have to work around them, because clearly, they take us in conflicting directions and we know that that this is an exercise in that humanity is about yin and yang and this is bringing us uh, uh, starkly in front of it all because it's all a reflection of ourselves our imperfections our goals and, and our ambitions and i think on that score of beware of delegation also beware of delegation in terms of our own personal responsibilities in all of this and i, and I think that's something that we in society, you know, pre AI, etc., we were already sort of looking to someone else somehow to uh, to solve uh, our problems. Uh, one little thing um, also, I thought we might want to do is take a leaf out of what's happened during this whole uh, vaccine process. And we know how difficult it has been to take a lot of populations over the world along with this process. It was very quick. Uh, we've gone from the quickest ever to produce a vaccine of five years to nine months. A lot of hesitancy, a lot of concern. Regulators paused at times. They paused. They said, we have to stop. Okay, it, it causes problems. But then we've then seen how people carried on afterwards. On AI, we're going to have to pause. We're going to have to take a moment. We're going to have to give uh, regulators and legislators time to breathe and work things out. And I think that's something that we should work, work in and factor in so that we have agency and we don't feel that something's being done to us and there's nothing that we can do about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Very, very pertinent. Gives us, again, a long to-do list to work on for the future, I guess. Uh, Laura, you have uh, the uh, the uh, unenviable task to, to wrap it up from, from your side. Over to you. Uh, thank you. If, if I may, I wanted to answer one question from the Q&A and then do a very quick uh, wrap up of uh, responding to some of the points of the other speakers. So I wanted to take the question of Anna Kap who's asking, uh, having control over the algorithm is essential, of course, but what about algorithms that can self-improve and include new elements without human control? So this discussion of self-learning algorithms, it often stays very high level, and I want to offer a very concrete example to, to, again, get down to the algorithm itself. Let's say, for example, you are designing an algorithm to assess credit risk for a bank, uh, and you're feeding it historical data on loans that people have been awarded and people who have defaulted on their loans. Um, and you are also feeding this algorithm data, for example, on financial transactions of those customers. Now, let's say you are worried about historical discrimination in uh, awarding uh, credit. So you explicitly don't uh, feed gender data, for example, to the algorithm. You leave out the column that says this was a man or a, or a woman who was awarded the credit. So you, you, you are aware of this discrimination and you take it out. It is true that the algorithm can still learn uh, uh, which people are men and which people are women in the data. It can infer that from seeing patterns of people shopping in, in certain places, buying certain products in cer certain stores or spending their money in certain ways. So it can detect patterns and it can link that to the historical bias in the data. So that is that is true. Um, and you, the problem is that you cannot ask the, the algorithm, you cannot ask, hey, did you identify gender in the data? Because indeed the algorithm doesn't know what it identified, it just identified the pattern. But you as a person who is designing this algorithm, you can do checks at the end and you can simulate, for example, 100 male customers or 100 female customers who are otherwise identical, feed it to the algorithm and see what the algorithm's recommendations are on awarding this credit risk. So it's your responsibility as an AI developer to check afterwards uh, if for these uh, fictional customers, the AI is not showing any, any bias. So even if it's self-learning. Self uh, and then I wanted to um, to, to wrap up by uh, responding to some of the, quest the things that I picked up from the previous speakers. So first of all, when Heather was saying we should send the algorithms to law school, I thought, well, shouldn't it be the AI developers then who go to law school? 
Uh, then, then when Anthony said, also legislators need new skills, they should go to school, but for AI and data skills. And also Vladimir said education is our best bet. So I think we can all agree that education is playing a crucial role in here. And we should try to bring these disciplines of lawmaking and data closer together. So let's send the AI developers to law school. Let's send the legislators to data school. And let's also not forget the compliance officers in private businesses. Also, the compliance officers should go to the same data school that the legislators are going to. So that's it. Fantastic, Laura. You have done my, my work in wrapping up. I've taken note of many of these uh, remarks as well. It has been a fascinating discussion. Really enjoyed it. We, we were a bit at 15 minutes um, longer than expected, but it was very much worth it. And we are still over 100, so it shows the great interest we had. Uh, just to conclude on this, we had the, the question on whether uh, uh, the development of AI is about to trigger the deepest and fastest shift humanity has ever experienced. 41 strongly agree, 48 somewhat agree. Uh, seven neither agree or disagree, and then very few disagree. So that shows actually there's the very strong con consensus on the on the disruptive e effects. Um, with this, thank you so much for your for your uh, for your contributions today. Uh, I learned a lot. I think there's a lot of it shall hopefully feed in out into our work, not only in the AIDA committee but also on the legislative work in the European Parliament. Uh, thank you to EPRS and, and all the staff involved for, for having made this possible and for having initiated this. Uh, thank you to the authors of the study and to our panelists and to our still 100 participants who have been with us today. With that, uh, good afternoon. Let's stay in touch and let's continue the discussions. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.